Hey, welcome and thanks for tuning in and listening on your favorite podcast listening app. It's Carm Capriato, the Automotive Aftermarket Podcast Guy. I need about four minutes of your time, just four. I've got a survey that will help me help you. We are five years in, consistently presenting podcasts each week, 800 plus episodes, 450 hours of content. How are we doing? I want to know. Please go to remarkableresults.biz slash survey or find a link on my homepage right to the survey. Give me a few minutes of your time or just reach out to me. Write me, Carm at remarkableresults.biz. Hey, welcome to 20 questions in about 30 minutes with shop owner Patrick McHugh from Bimmer Rescue. This is raw, relevant, and personal. And I know you'll grab onto a few great thoughts and ideas from Patrick that will help guide you in your journey to remarkable results. Hey, none of this is possible without Napa support. You know, before we jump into 20 questions in 30 minutes with Patrick McHugh, let me thank Napa Pro Image for their continued support. Napa Expo has been officially rescheduled, but you knew that. It'll be February 1st through the 4th, 2021. I hope you've written that down. Las Vegas will be painted blue and gold as Team Napa puts on the fabulous event that was planned prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Napa wants to thank everyone for understanding the event postponement and sends well wishes to you and your families. Rest assured, Team Napa is as energized and invested as ever in Napa Expo, and we look forward to hosting you in February 2021. Hey, Patrick McHugh's got some great advice to share in this 20 questions in 30 minutes episode. They will literally tell us everything we need to know about them so that we can line up what we recommend exactly with what their goals are and what they value. That one thing there, listening to what a client tells you they want, has changed our entire customer service atmosphere. Hey, more with Patrick McHugh in just one minute. Now, don't forget to watch the Aftermarket's most fun video show, aftermarketweekly.com. You can watch it live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern time. Even watch it right there on the website. Now, go to aftermarketweekly.com where you can, as I said, watch it live and view all the archived episodes. I'm your host. And don't forget, you get a shop tour each week. Hey, don't forget to let me know how you like this new format. I've already heard from a bunch of listeners that this is a cool way to learn. Talk to me at karm at remarkableresults.biz. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Find the key talking points, Patrick's bio, and links to his previous episodes at remarkableresults.biz slash E563. Hey, a warm welcome to Patrick McHugh. Hello, Patrick. Hey, Carm. Thanks for having me on. You've been a, a great uh, contributor to the to the podcast and coming on here for 20 questions in 30 minutes. How much fun can this be, huh? Love the format. Quickly, before we start, uh, the COVID experience that you had and, you know, not seeing the kids for 45 days, can you just share with a few minutes of your appreciation for family? Absolutely. So when this all began, I have three small children, five-year-old, three-year-old, and a uh, 10-month-old. And when it all started, we took them out of daycare. And my wonderful wife was working from home and also trying to manage three children running around. And we we had a babysitter help us out, but she only lasted so long. And, and my wife was about to pull her hair out. You know, she's trying to do her career and these kids. And I had to be a hundred percent focused on the shop, keeping cars coming in the door, keeping everybody comfortable, doing our best to, to pull the shop through what was going on. So I couldn't help out, even though I wanted to in the worst way. Went ahead and my parents are renovating a house about an hour and a half away from here. They moved out temporarily and we brought the kids down there and they took care of the kids during the day while my wife worked. And with the whole COVID thing going on, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what my exposure was going to be at the shop. I was doing concierge pickup and drop off at work and we didn't know what to expect, so we, we kept separate. My parents you know, aren't at high risk, but they are older, and they, they didn't want to be exposed to COVID. So we basically went 45 days without seeing each other. My kids were stuck down there. I was stuck in Richmond, and it was the, the strangest, hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Did it change you? It just 100% rewired my brain for what I really am thankful for and what I really need in life. And I've spent more quality time with my kids now. Phones are going away after work. We we are paying more attention to our kids. We are spending more time with them because sometimes when you miss something, 
when something's gone for a little while, you realize how important it really is to you. So I'd say it's a blessing. There's so many unbelievable stories out there, and thank you for sharing that. Let's let's jump into our 20 questions. My question number one here is, what do you do for fun? So as you probably know, I am the founder of Race Bar, one of the strangest racing teams ever known. We have a lemons race car with a beer tap on the back. We throw huge parties, and we, we do endurance racing, 24-hour races. I love that. I love to sail. I love boats. I love anything that goes, cars motorcycles, anything that has a motor or, or moves around, I love. Patrick, can anyone find Race Bar on YouTube? Yeah, absolutely. Just type in Race Bar on YouTube or Race Bar on Facebook and you'll go into a whole new world. So let me say this. I spent some time, I think it could have been a whole 20 or 40 minutes watching an incredibly well done video. I mean, almost like movie documentary thing. And uh, so well done, so much fun. And you guys, I mean, you get out there, uh, I don't know what you say, but you guys were serious. We're serious about having fun. Uh, racing is priority number two or three. We're out there to have fun, put smiles on people's faces, act like a bunch of teenagers, and just have a great time. Good for you. Uh, race bar. You got to check it out. Uh, question two, get any great advice in your lifetime that you still follow today? Sure. Somebody told me, I don't even know who it was when we were having kids, when I was going to the you know, we're going to the hospital in a few days to have our first kid. They said, well, I said, well, what, what's, the, what's the advice? What do I need to do? What's the most important thing? And he just said, be there. He just said, be around. He let me interpret that however I wanted, but that meant be present to me. Get off your phone, get off Facebook, look at your kids, play with your kids, interact with your kids, get in their brain and, and always, always be in their head. So that, that's what I gathered. Amazing stuff. How did you decide to become a shop owner, man? The county decided for me because I was kind of shade tree mechanicking in the backyard and I had eight cars in the driveway and they sent me a nasty gram in the mail and said, you need to get these cars out of here. And my wife sat me down at the table and said, you need to go back to be a pilot and go fly jets or you need to go start a shop. And I chose the right and correct path, I think. Why not a pilot? Well, just that first life lesson, right? I was gone four or five days a week. It's kind of hard to have a, a really secure family life when you're gone that much. Patrick, do you still have the fire in your belly that you had when you first started? Absolutely. I started this business with not a lot of knowledge, not a lot of tools, not a lot of help, but a lot of passion, a lot of excitement. And People were drawn to that, and I think they still are, and I'm still excited. Every single day I get out of bed and I drive to work with excitement. Now, yeah, of course, there's gray hairs on my head from some things, but I love what I do. I love the shop. I love everything about it. So even if you got up and you weren't 100%, you still push through it, right? Absolutely. Drink a cup of coffee, kick some butt. Hey, if you could send a message to yourself um, 10 years ago, what would you tell your younger you? I would probably reach through the screen and just strangle him because he was <laughs> such a, he was a bit of an arrogant dude who thought he knew a lot more than he did. And I would tell him to listen to his peers, listen to his seniors, and don't fall in the, in the pits that other people have fallen in. Use their wisdom. So I that's what I would tell. Watch some of these CARM casts. That's what I would have told them. Hey, you got to check out this CARM guy. Was that cocky confidence, do you think you had? Sure. I think it's the cocky confidence that every 22 or 23-year-old has. It just kind of, it's par for the course in many ways. Uh, you may have already given a little bit of the answer to this next question. How do you manage work-life harmony? I've always been one to turn the switch off at about 5 o'clock, 5.30 latest. Um, those kids are waiting for me back home or they're at school and I need to pick them up. And I have seen so many shop owners that just live their entire lives at their shop and they stay till 7 or 8 p.m. I made a dedication to myself and my family a long time ago that that wasn't going to be me. Do I work hard when I'm here? Yes. But at 5 o'clock, whatever fires are burning, we can put them out in the morning. Could you make more money if you stick around a little later? I would think so, but I think in the big term, the big, the big picture, no, because I would probably burn myself out. I can't make any money if I burn myself out. So my personal sanity is part of our success plan. I have to be sane and healthy. You are just so perfectly laying up into the reason that I podcast, and that is to share, you know, the wisdom that you ha have because of the struggles that you either experience yourself or the ones that you don't want to have. So thank you for that wonderful advice. Uh, question seven, your biggest learning moment? 
COVID was a big one, man. We made so many huge changes to not just our operations, but our budgeting and to how we interacted with our clients, how we talked to them. Uh, our first question during COVID when somebody picked up the phone and we got them on the phone was to say, how's your family? How are you doing? The car always came second. And guess what? That's here to stay. Uh, we work on cars, but we work for people. And to work for people, we need to know about their family. We need to know what they value. We need to know what they do with their car. We need to know so much. And um, that has just enriched our relationship model that we have at this shop. So COVID was a huge turning point for us. I interviewed John DeJulius. Um, in fact, his episode, uh, I think, went out this past week, Customer Service Revolution. So much of his teachings is just what you said. You talked about. I read that Ford thing on your uh, oh, you website. Did, yeah. F-O-R-D, I, yeah, yeah. I love it. I Isn't read that, that great? Yeah. yeah. Family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Well, thanks for bringing that up. Thank you for listening. Is community important to you? Oh my gosh, yes. So community is everything. We we are very, very active in the community. We do the community art shows. We've been doing that for years where we bring an artist in and we have a huge party and an art opening and we interact with all of the clients and mix our friends and family and clients together. To me, I'm most passionate about my STEM classes for kids where we teach kids how to start, how to jumpstart a car, how to change a tire and get kids interested in, in auto repair. Community is what brought me to where I'm at. And it is our responsibility as humans to give back to the community when we can. So we do anything we can, anything I possibly can, I'll do for our community. We're always trying to dream up something new. I'm so glad I met you and we did a podcast and you shared the the STEM story for kids. I have shared that story in podcasts, on the side with people, in speeches that I've given. It is such a phenomenon. And if anyone out there, once we get normalized, whatever that means, um, and you want to get back into the, the whole education piece, please listen to Patrick's episode or just go to my website, type in uh, STEM and, and listen to it. Uh, I'm sure you'd be more than happy to share your format with anyone. Oh, sure. And we're, we're just starting a video series now. Since we can't do formal classes, can't have people in the shop, we're starting a video um, STEM series for, for kids and for adults too. And, but you don't have to make a perfect video. You could, I mean, it doesn't have to be a $20,000 video, does it? No, it's got, it, it, it can be very real. So Coming up, Patrick talks about the top three most important needs when opening a shop and his solution to time waste. Hey, it's Carm here to tell you about the best shop management solution for your auto care center, Trax Enterprise. Now, since Napa introduced Trax in 1989, it's been the industry's leading shop management system out there. Today, Trax Enterprise offers even more of the features auto care center owners want. Things like a powerful interactive scheduling calendar, faster and streamlined workflow, multi-shop capabilities, easy pay consumer financing integration, and more. That means you can count on Trax Enterprise to help drive your success today and well into the future. The tabbed interface lets you open and view multiple estimates, ROs, invoices, and purchase orders all at the same time. You can even place windows side by side, over or under, or drag a tab from another application outside Trax to open another window. One auto care center owner said he loves being able to have 10 to 12 work orders open at once. Enterprise also offers a Microsoft Outlook type calendar so you can view daily, weekly, and monthly schedules, drag and drop appointments between days and times, and block time to indicate length of work. Punch out to Mitchell Pro Demand is another huge benefit. It provides embedded labor, part, maintenance, and fluid capacities that can be transferred to estimates and repair orders within Trax. Trax Enterprise also streamlines parts ordering. Just one click and it's done. The mobile capture app sold another auto care owner on Trax Enterprise. He said there's no reason to write VINs by hand anymore. You can decode the VIN from a mobile device and send all the information directly to Trax. There are reporting features too. For example, with just a couple of clicks, you can find out how many repair orders you've written in a month. Talk to your Napa Auto Parts store and find out more about what Trax Enterprise can do for you, plus the hundreds of other great things the auto care program has to offer. Ever made a major pivot in the business? And if yes, what was it? The COVID, I already answered that in many ways. Um, that was one pivot. 
Another one was hiring top techs. We, we hired some of the best techs in Richmond and it, it really changed our business for the better and put us a tier above everybody else. That happened by four or five years ago and we really upped our game and brought some ex- incredible technicians into our shop and uh, many that are still with us today and it's really changed our A game. But I'd say COVID is my biggest pivot in the shop so far. COVID has been a life changer in every regard for every walk of life, for every business, for every family, for every situation. Oh, so here we are recording this. We'll tell everyone that Apex was moved to be a virtual event this particular November. A major, major, unbelievable move in the industry. So that's, again, that's a, that's a pivot for Apex. Is share a car count idea. Is, it a, is car count important to you? Car counts everything. Car count is the fuel that you're putting in the tank for the shop that you're driving down the road, right? So we uh, went to went to Concierge. The minute this COVID stuff became real, we shifted all of our marketing. We we pulled down marketing that we were putting a lot of resources in and juiced up all of our social media news presence, being on the news. To Concierge, we'll come to you. We'll pick up your car. You'll never see us. You'll never have to shake hands with us. We'll return everything back sanitized, cleaned, ready to go. All consultation will be done over the phone or with Zoom meetings, which has been very, very cool. That basically pulled us through uh, the beginning of COVID where car count just vanished. The phone wasn't ringing, so we went through our entire database and called probably 4,000 clients on the telephone to do welfare checks on them. Are you okay? Is your family safe? Um, Those two things literally pulled us through COVID and will continue to pull us in the future. We're not going to stop doing that kind of stuff because it really worked. Concierge Service, the invisible service repair company. Yeah, we call it Bimmer Rescue To Go. We have a little logo Bimmer. that we made. <laughs> I love it. Patrick, what drives you? My kids. Uh, I've always been an internally driven person. I always have to have to go faster, further, and go around the next corner and see what's next. But my kids in many ways have. My daughter's five, and I... I have to prove, I have to show her that if I want to do something, I can do it. If I want to achieve a goal, I need to be, I need to show up. I need to work hard. I need to stick to it. I need to deal with failures to get through it. I need her to see me doing that so that she can go do that in her own life. You know, your kids are watching you and I have to show her that I can achieve whatever goal I want to and that it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of frustration to get there. But when you do get there, the reward is great. Are you ever satisfied? I'm satisfied with many things right now. I'm satisfied with, with, with my family and with my, my team and my, my life right now. But of course, I want more. We want to go multi-shop. We want to have another shop where we can further help our community. Um, I think my art shows and a lot of my STEM stuff would, would echo farther in a general repair shop. So we are actively um, trying to acquire a, another shop right now. So, you know, will, will I ever stop? I don't know. There's probably a certain threshold where I'll let my foot off the gas a little bit, but, but not much. So, No doubt that's a trend. I've been talking to so many um, people on the phone and, and, and some new interviews that are, that are coming up about growth and adding stores. If I asked a good friend of yours or a peer, what's the secret to your success? What would they say? I think community would come up. I think... Just my my personality. I I am magnetic. I I am drawn to people, but they're also drawn to me. We do the right thing in our shop, even if it doesn't always feel good for us. We are always there to help, and we we love to help people, not necessarily just cars. Plus, my mustache would probably come into play. That's looking nice and upright there. Huh? <laughs> nice job on that. Um, any secrets to your time management or time suck? Yeah. So I struggle with this a lot because I'm a very Like I get distracted easily. I have a little black book. So at the beginning of the year, I open the first page and I write my goals. Right now, it is to acquire three shops within the next two years, to teach my daughter um, to think objectively, you know, to start to question things in the world, and to be a better husband, to be a, a good husband to my wife. And so those are my three goals. And every single day, I put five bullet points, one, two, three, four, five. And Every single thing that I do every day needs to reflect one of those three goals. I can only do five things. If I try to do 20 things, I'll get nothing done, but I can definitely do five things. So I'll write out, you know, 
speak with my coach about uh, a business acquisition that I'm considering, go to a counseling session with my wife, take my daughter to the park and, and look at bugs or trees or whatever we need to look at. But I, I always do my five things. And if I check them all off, I circle the, a win on the top of the page. And if I win enough of those days, I've won the entire week. And if I win an entire week, I've won a month and then a year and then I've gotten to my goals. So that's my way of breaking down a big goal into attainable little tasks that I need to do each day. It's called the power list and it's a um, Andy Frazella type thing. You can, you can look into him, but that has changed my life and kept me on task, kept me kicking butt during the day, not just kind of looking for things to do and putting out fires and getting involved in stuff I don't need to get involved with. Um, so yeah, it's been, that's been very helpful. Good stuff. Uh, I think I know the answer to this next question. What are you doing to put the customer first in your business? We listen. This is not a new thing for us, but when a client calls us and they've never been here, we listen to what they say saying. We ask some very important questions and then we shut up and listen. The most important question is, great, how long have you had this car? Well, I've had it for four years. Okay. How many miles does it have on it now? Uh, roughly. Okay, it has 120K on it now. Okay. Tell me what you do. Tell me what you do with the car. What's your life like? You know, What's your occupation? Where do you drive to? Well, I commute every day. I drive 20, 30 miles a day. And, and in my head, I'm calculating, okay, you drive about 12,000, 15,000 miles a year. Does that sound right? That's about the national average. Yes, it sounds right. Great. Now, this is the most important question. How long do you want to keep the car? How, do, how long do you traditionally keep your assets before you sell them or trade them in and buy a new car? Well, I want to keep it uh, as long as I can. I want to keep it uh, you know, probably six, seven more years. Great. We are listening to what that client values and they will literally tell us everything we need to know about them so that we can line up what we recommend exactly with what their goals are and what they value. That one thing there, listening to what a client tells you they want, has changed our entire customer service atmosphere. That completely alleviates the problem of, of you trying to sell too much stuff to somebody who didn't want to do that much stuff to their car. It also alleviates under-servicing a car that somebody really wanted to do more on. Basically, tells you everything you need to know to really, really help that client and consult with them rather than sell to them. That's been our whole thing. Does it take price out of the equation? Price is always in the equation. And what this means is we're going to do whatever we can do with your car, you know, according to budget, to, to a budget that makes sense. And, you know, price does always come up, but this makes the client feel like we're, we do care about their budget and that we're thinking about their budget. But if they tell us they want perfection, you know, we should do as much as we can now. And then we should set um, another couple appointments for the next year to knock out the rest of the stuff. Good advice. Uh, interesting next question. The top three most important needs to open a shop. Now, it could be from scratch or it could be uh, your second store. How do you want to take that? Well, let's go with from scratch. You need to have passion. You need to be excited. You need to be ready to work really hard. But you also need coaches. You need help. So many of us technician minds come up from going being a technician and open a shop and running a business, being profitable, being a good business requires an entire different skill set than diagnose car, fix car, next. So you need to seek training. You need to seek advice. You need to have an open mind. That's starting a business, acquiring a shop. You need to have done it right in your first shop. There's no sense making a copy of a bad copy. You have to be profitable. You have to have the financial means to, to take a huge hit to open a new shop. Um, you got to be ready to take risk, but you also need those coaches again. You need to be able to value that shop, figure out what it's worth, figure out what your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats are going to be, and determine if it's even going to be a good buy in the first place. And in order to scale, Patrick, you've got to have good processes and systems. And I know that there's an awful lot of shop owners that go from one to two and realize that their processes and systems weren't sound enough. And then they rock into it. And then they actually had some accelerated growth after two. But 
everyone knows how important scaling uh, to scale you need to have processes and systems so why don't they do it for second store and uh, because it's wow i can grow and i can get this deal and oh it's going to close in 30 days and we're not even ready but let's do it yeah for sure and i i've been criticized before for over processing my smaller businesses but i i know i'm going to need those processes as we scale up Thank you for that. Uh, next question, question number 16. Strong teams always win. What is your winning formula in developing a great, strong team? So we have a great, strong team. We have some of those incredible technicians here. But what's the most awesome part is that they all work together as a team. We've motivated them from their pay plans to be team-oriented. They're paid as a team. But these guys work well together. And, and when we hire them, Management chooses a couple choices of, of a new hire that's going to come to the shop, but the team ultimately picks which one it's going to be. Um, we present them with options, but they make the final call over who's going to come on to their team. They have some skin in the game as to, you know, if that person fails, well, they pick that person. Ultimately, the team is the one that has to release the person if it doesn't work out, which has never happened. They're more likely to, to support and build up and boost that person if they were actually the ones to pick that person in the first place. So that's been a great way, but also culture. We've, we eat together. We have lunches together. We communicate probably better than a lot of shops do. We talk about things that, you know, look at my daughter. We tell her when she, somebody hits her in the playground, she's supposed to tell that person how it made them feel when they hit her. That hurt me. I don't like that you did that. Don't do that again. We do that in our shop. Somebody does something somebody doesn't like, we talk about it. We say, hey, when you did that, it made me feel like you didn't respect my value as a technician or you didn't respect my opinion. And that makes me feel this big. Don't do that anymore. Just listen to me. When I say you need to do this, do it. Trust me. You know, we, we have deep discussions in our shop. And every time we get through a little hurdle, it makes us a little bit stronger and a little bit closer of a team. Fascinating. And I know we could actually do a whole podcast on what you just said, but we're staying true to our 20 and 30. Number 17, the secret to a good job interview. In my opinion, the questions and listening, just like just like our customer service thing, right? I have some absolutely awesome questions that we ask. One of my favorite, which will probably reveal all of the struggles you're about to have with this person you're about to hire. And it is it goes like this, Carm. If I were to ask your friends and family or other coworkers what your biggest weakness is, what you struggle with the most, what would they say? They'll sit there for a while, but they'll tell you pretty much exactly what you're going to probably need to coach and train on the most. Our newest hire, he says, I, I move too fast. I, I need to slow down. And that is exactly what we've been working on the most uh, so the questions you ask, very well-designed, pointed questions that your coaches hopefully have taught you, and then then shutting up and listening. You should talk about one-third of the time in an interview, and the, the potential employee should talk the rest of the time. If I said to you, one of my weaknesses are squirrel, squirrel, nut, 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 you know, kind of like you, Patrick, but you still loved my energy and all the other things that I could bring, you'd hire me. And you'd and the whole team would know. Uh, my God, uh, don't have the tool guy come in with a flashy new tool because phew, he's gone. And there must be a way to help discipline that person. Absolutely. Yeah. We in our team, we all know what each other's weaknesses are, and we we work around them and we support each other. How are you finding good technicians? Question eighteen. We found our last one was a referral from another technician. He knew his friend worked at the. The, his his old work, and he said, "Hey, you got to come over here to Bim Rescue." So it was literally a, a, a in house referral. Um, but we've also had luck with um, the tool guys, telling the tool guys that we're hiring and explaining, getting to know the tool guy and telling, getting him to understand what our culture is about, and inviting him to lunch so he knows what we're about. And he can't help but talk about that. He can't so. recommend the team if uh, he, he, you know, if he doesn't love the business. Absolutely, exactly. Would your organization crumble if you stepped aside? No, I've actually in some ways been pushed aside because I tend to micromanage and put out fires and get too involved. So uh, no, I think I could leave my organization for a month and I they would try their best not to call me. Maybe they would once or twice, but they would be just fine without me if I had to go. What job would be minimized? I mean, are you doing the social media? Are you doing the marketing? 
the marketing would be the problem. I'm doing most of the marketing in the shop, so um, I would have to put things in place to to pull us through for a month um, if I was completely gone. By the way, I just want to say, before our last question, this has been a phenom interview, Patrick. You are on fire, and thank you so much for this. But here is the last question. If you could pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? I got to tear your question up a little bit because I think that the path and the journey and the trip is worth more than the actual skill and than the actual end result. I would love to learn to play the piano, but I think it would be sad if I instantly knew how to do it. I think the learning process is almost more fun than the actual destination. Does that make sense? Yes, because when I was a kid, I had piano lessons. Mm -hmm. And so if you asked me that question, I would say the same thing. But I would also say, why was I so stubborn and so strong to convince my mom to let me quit learning how to play the piano? And that was a life lesson. I want to know how to play the piano. In fact, at my age, people said, go take it up again. Yeah, I think I, I think I know what you need to do now, Carm. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up the piano because you brought back an interesting memory that upsets me every time I think about why did I give up? Why was I so convincing? I, w- I was a hell of a salesman back then to, to convince my mom to say no, and, and I thought I was actually doing pretty good. Perhaps that was the skill that you learned is how to is sales. Perhaps you... Learn how to make your mother see it your way. And maybe that was the maybe that was the whole point. Maybe it wasn't about the piano lessons or the the end result at all. Uh, yeah, man, so I just turned you all around. I'm doing what I'm doing today because of that. It's so interesting, Patrick McHugh, Bimmer Rescue. Thank you for twenty in thirty, my friend. I appreciate that. This is really cool. Thank you, Carm. This is this is awesome. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.